Are you searching for answers? Discover your true identity. Stay tuned to Shalom World. Good evening. Welcome again tonight to Shalom World, the nine o'clock series. My name is Peter Thompson. I live here in Western Canada, Calgary, Alberta, and I serve in the church primarily in the task of teaching, evangelization, and especially the great joy of mission. In our third evening together, as you probably know, we are, if you followed the last couple, we are looking at the divine praises. The theme is putting God first. And tonight I'd like to focus on the third one, which says, who is Jesus? And the actual divine praise is, blessed be Jesus Christ, true God and true man. Blessed be Jesus Christ, true God and true man. So that big question, who is Jesus? I thank God that by God's grace and mercy, I can say Jesus is Lord. He is Lord and King of Kings. But we live in a world this day where vast numbers do not know of Jesus. Millions, if not billions. They're estimated there's over 7 billion people on the face of the earth at this time over seven billion. We know that over a billion have been baptized as Catholics, but sadly, probably amongst that billion plus Catholics, many themselves maybe only know Jesus intellectually, but not intimately. And so what I hope to share in the few minutes we have tonight together, as we reflect on who is Jesus and the question mark who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus to me? If we go back to Scripture itself, and, you know, again, we see Jesus as the fulfillment of hundreds of prophecies in the Old Testament. But I'll take us to a place where Jesus took his 12 apostles. He took them to northern Israel, to a place called Caesarea Philippi. It's evidently just up in the northern part of Israel, near the border. Now, I know that when I went there to the Holy Land, and I've had the privilege of walking in the footsteps of Jesus, and I really wanted to go to that location of Caesarea Philippi. But actually, our mission, our pilgrimage director uh, said, well, uh, he was hesitant in taking us up there, uh, because at that particular time, uh, there was possibility of rockets coming over, so it was a dangerous period. But from what I understand, from what other people who have visited tell me, there's a big rock face, a big rock cliff, and on the top of it are the ruins to Caesar Augustus, a false god. It was built by Herod, evidently. And then at the foot of this cliff face is a cave, and out of the cave is flowing waters, a spring of water coming out, which I understand is the headwaters of the Jordan River. To the pagan people of past, they thought that was the entrance to the underworld. And they would throw into that cave various uh, gifts and offerings to placate the spirits of the dead. And Jesus proposes a question to his apostles there at the foot of this cave. 
at the foot of this cliff. He says, who do men say that I am? Who do men say that I am? And so I don't know which apostles say, well, some say you're, a, you're Elijah, come back. And remember the prophecy was that Elijah was caught up with a fiery chariot and horses. And he's not a reincarnation because he didn't die. But John the Baptist is actually the spirit of Elijah, that prophetic spirit. John the Baptist. And as some of the other apostles said, well, they thought Jesus was John the Baptist come back to life or a great prophet. And then Jesus poses the question to the 12. And he poses that same question to us. Who do you say that I am? And Simon, of course, at that point cries out, you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus says, you know, Simon, this it was, it was not by your own intellect, but my heavenly Father revealed that to you. And then comes that beautiful discourse after that where Simon, thou art now Kepha, rock, and upon this rock I'll build my church. Gates of hell will not prevail against you. To you I give the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. But that question, who do you say that I am? And in my own journey in faith, I came to a point in my life where I had to answer that question myself. Now, I was born in London, England. You probably guessed that by my accent. I'm not born in Canada. We came here over 50 years ago. But I was born in London, and two weeks after I was born, I was taken to our parish church of St. Anselm's, and there I was baptized born again of water and the Spirit. And my parents and my godparents prayed those words of faith in Almighty God and Jesus Christ for me. And then I went through all the process. I was trained well. I was immersed well in my faith. I thank God for the sisters and the Zaverian brothers that taught me, that taught me about Jesus Christ. And I thank God for that foundation that I had, that gift of God. And actually, when I was about 16 years of age, I was saying, Lord, what do you want of my life? Well, actually, earlier. And I really wanted to be a missionary, a missionary to Africa. Well, at that time, the only way one could be probably a missionary was to be, if you were a girl, a religious sister, or if a boy, a priest, or a brother. And I tested a vocation uh, to go to Africa with, as a priest with the Holy Ghost Fathers, the Spiritans, as they know. And so I had all the gifts of God, all of the formation. But the priesthood wasn't for me. I came out after a couple of years, and um, a couple of years later, met my wife to be. We married in 1962, entered into a beautiful a vocation of marriage, and then came to this country and got caught up in the world, in the flesh. And there was a period where I was questioning, what do I really believe? And a really what it was was a response because my life had turned away from God. I was on that wide road to destruction. Pornography had its grasp on me. And I nearly destroyed my marriage, but a God in his great mercy, his great compassion, he did not break the broken reed or, or, or extinguish the flickering flame of faith. To all intents and purposes, I was a good Catholic, going to Mass on Sunday with my family, but inside I needed Jesus Christ and I had to answer that question. It got to the point where in the celebration of the Mass, we always pray the creed. The creed is the core of our belief. And I was questioning, can I say that? I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in the Catholic Church. And sometimes I would remain silent because God was asking me that same question. Who do you say that I am? 
I thank God for holy women, holy women in my life. I thank God for a mother who was praying for me. I thank God for my wife, Madeline, who cried out to God, there's got to be more to my life, my faith and my marriage. And she was, by the grace of God, introduced to a prayer group in our parish. I couldn't understand how anybody would want to go to the church in the middle of the week for a couple of hours, but I took her. And one evening I came in, came into that prayer group, that prayer meeting, and I heard people speaking about Jesus and, and, and speaking to Jesus in a very intimate and beautiful, warm way. So much so that it, it, Jesus was not just an intellectual belief, but in their heart, in their mind. As the Lord says in Hosea, I think it's Hosea 11, how I have longed to draw you with cords, with bands of love. As a father infants lifts his infant to his cheek, so I have longed to lift you to my cheek. And I was drawn by the Holy Spirit. And so much so that eventually we took what's called a Life in the Spirit seminar. Just seven evenings of exploring the very core, the heart of our faith. And to know that God loved me so much that he sent his only begotten son to this world. The world became flesh and dwelt amongst us. That if Peter would only believe, he would have eternal life. I can remember the day, the evening, December the 3rd, 1974, a long time ago, in the sacristy of our parish at that time, St. Gerard's, I recommitted my life to Jesus. I answered that question. Peter, who do you say that I am? I answered that question. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And renewed, as it were, my baptismal vows and entered in to a new life in Christ. I said at the beginning how the Lord had put upon my heart that, uh, for a desire for mission work. And I mentioned the other day how I've experienced that and traveling to many parts of the world, but primarily in Africa, in Africa to share the gospel. And I love the joy of the people there as they cry out, Jesus ni buana, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Sadly, as I said, there are so many who do not know Jesus, maybe only as a curse word. They don't know him who is the, the love of our life and who loves us so much and who came to this world. If we journey with that story and if we reveal that again, how beautifully God prepared his world for his son to come, Prophecy after prophecy in the Old Testament. I think I was listening to a talk by Archbishop Fulton Sheen and he said there was, if I remember correctly, 365 prophecies, all, all affirmed in Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. I've never found them all, but when you think of it, Isaiah 7:14, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son and name him Emmanuel which means God is with us. The virgin shall bear a son, the word becoming flesh. In the beginning of the Gospel of John, again, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. Even the address <laughs> where the Saviour, the Redeemer would be born is given to us in Scripture. In Micah 5, 1, you Bethlehem, least of the towns of Judah, from you will come the one who will redeem Israel. And Bethlehem, of course, it means city of bread, and the bread that has come down from heaven, the word become flesh, Jesus Christ, as John shows us in John chapter 6. Jesus is beautiful dialogue on the bread that has come down from heaven, that he is that bread. Prophecies concerning his crucifixion. Psalm 22, beginning with those words, Elo, Elo, Lama Sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forgotten me? 
the words that Jesus spoke from the cross. Even that in that psalm, a description of his crucifixion, totally fulfilled in Jesus Christ, even to the point where the soldiers cast dice for his clothes. Isaiah 53, the suffering servant, by his stripes we are healed. Now we live in the church at this time, thanks be to God, where all of those struggles in the early church were dealt with in various councils. The struggles to know who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? And there were terrible heresies terrible times and that, that the church was broken and split. The worst probably time was in the early part of the fourth century when a priest by the name of Arius denied the divinity of Christ, said, well, if he's the son, he must have been created. He can't be equal with the father. A terrible time in history where the church was split, only a handful of bishops remaining true and faithful. A great council was called, the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. And great debates between the Arians and the bishops faithful. And there was a great debate actually over one word and one letter. <laughs> the word was homoousios in Greek, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly which means consubstantial, one in substance. And the Arian said, well, if you put a little I in the middle, it won't make much difference and then we can sign off on this. If you put that little I in the middle, it becomes homo eusios, which means like substance, but not the same. Would have changed Christianity. I thank God for the Holy Spirit who guided the church through these centuries of trial and tribulation. Again, if you're watching tonight, and if you're questioning in your own heart, who is Jesus? Maybe you only know him intellectual. He wants a close and loving and intimate relationship with you. Some beautiful books that would really help you. C.S. Lewis's beautiful book, Mere Christianity, another man that came from atheism, a great intellect, great mind, and journeyed to Jesus Christ, true God and true man. Blessed be the name of Jesus, true God and true man. Yes, the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, a living flesh. And of course, Jesus is not dead. He is alive. He rose from the death after his crucifixion and burial. I thank God for God's mercy, God's compassion, God's love for me that drew me ever closer to him through these years. I thank God that he's given me the opportunity to be able to share my faith and to share my faith again with you this evening in these divine praises, these beautiful prayers that we cry out to God. Blessed be Jesus Christ, true God and true man. And I pray that you likewise can say, Jesus is Lord. In whatever language you have, Jesus is Lord. He is Lord and Savior. And a beautiful creed, I mentioned the creed. The creed that was actually before the Nicene Creed is the Apostles' Creed that was formulated probably in the first century AD. So let's close with that beautiful creed of belief in Almighty God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. 
I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. God bless you. Good night. Amen. and grateful to welcome and encourage Shalom Ministries in the Diocese. I see your work as being truly prophetic in bringing more and more people to friendship with our Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, I want to bless you and all the people of Shalom and all those who are coming to know Christ through your ministry. So I bless you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. God be with you all.